thank you for this time we have right now. Um, we acknowledge that there is a time for everything under heaven. And that this weekend has been a significant time. There's been planning and prayerful preparation. Uh, and we have sensed that um, this is a significant time for us as a hahi. And we pray, Lord, that, um, that it will be something significant in this community also. So we bless uh, your word to us today. Bless Andrew as he speaks. In the name of Jesus, amen. Uh, kia ora koutou, ko Andrew Pika Tokunga. Um, thank you, Paul, and thank you very much to Motuika Baptist um, and to Ropata um, for, for hosting us this weekend. It's been really special to us, those who were here. Um, when I spoke, we'll know that we have, I have, my first ancestor came to Motuika um, and settled here and was the first elected member of Parliament for Motuika and Massacre Bay. So that's part of my whakapapa connection um, here. So significant for me and um, I want to thank uh, Ropata and, uh, uh, and uh, Ngāti Rārua, uh, Te Ate Awa, for, for hosting us as mana whenua. Thank you. And to Sean and to so many others, um, I'll come back to, to thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before I start, I hope it's okay. Um, I'm just conscious that for many of us, um, the report that's come out from the Royal Commission of Inquiry is definitely on our hearts. Um, um, and I, it's a bit of a step sideways, but I just really feel it would be, it's, it's, it's a very significant report. It's been described as a disgrace for our country um, and has literally come out this week. And so I thought it would be appropriate um, just to pray. Um, uh, there's many other things that need to happen, but I think prayer is one of them. So um, a prayer that has been released from the Anglican bishops of Aotearoa. Merciful God, we come to you in sorrow. We would not hear. We did not believe. Our silence condemned the innocent and the powerless. Lord, strengthen and empower the survivors now and align our hearts with your justice. Amen. Uh, this morning... Um, Sorry, it's a bit of a step sideways. I just felt that that was insignificant given, given the context we're in. Um, I'm keen to talk this morning a little bit around the idea of covenant. Um, the idea of covenant. Um, covenanting's at the heart of Baptist life. I know that, who, you know, I know that there's kind of little B Baptists, there's kind of don't really want to be Baptists, and there's capital B Baptists and everything in between. Um, Kate's uh, I but part of, part of my journey has been through, through, through Baptist life, and, and what I've loved about it is this concept about covenanting together. Um, early Baptists were troublemakers, um, troublemakers mainly for the gospel. Um, they turned their backs on the church of the day, and they demanded a more radical expression of freedom in the gospel. Um, Matthew 18 animated them, um, this text um, and particularly what they, they found the emphasis upon, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. So no need for bishops, no need for external rulers and rules and authorities, because Christ is present when we gather together. The church is free from all other rules and rulers. Um, a, a radical freedom. Um, and this, you know, in, the, in, in 17th century Europe, this was radical. Not just because you had a different way of doing church, but because you were causing trouble for the whole society. It was seditious. It was problematic. Um, it was treasonous. And it was illegal. And it was made illegal. As England particularly cracked down on these troublemakers. Um, this is um, a book by uh, Thomas Edwards. Thomas Edwards was one of the government's um, heresy hunters. Um, his role was to go around and find out where these Baptists were and what the heck they were up to and report them to the authorities who could then go and capture them and their illegal sermons and their illegal way of doing church and put them in prison, primarily in Newgate Prison in London. Um, so in his, in his book, it's called Gangrena. Um, you can hear the word there, gangrenous. Um, Baptists, that's your descriptor, gangrene. 
you're a poison. Um, and in it, Edwards complained about this. He said, among all the confusion and disorder in church matters, both of opinions and practices, my lord, the king, um, all, and particularly of all sorts of mechanics, and I love this because I'm a mechanic, I was a mechanic, it was my first trade, um, taking upon them to preach and baptize. Like, who gave mechanics the right to do this, is what he says. And as smiths, tailors, shoemakers, peddlers, weavers, etc. And there are also some women preachers who constantly keep lectures, preaching weekly to many men and women. This was the report of the heresy hunter to the king. These were the troublemakers. Way too much freedom, way too much um, you know, kind of <coughs> scope to do things different. He says, that it, they say that it is lawful for a woman to preach, and why, why would they not? Having gifts as well as men, and some of them do actually preach, having great resort to them. Gangrene. That's what Baptists are. Gangrene. Troublemakers for the gospel. Um, men and women, many Baptists, um, when Baptists used to preach, because it was illegal during this period, um, the restoration of the monarchy, um, there would be a curtain there'd be a curtain in the room where only the insiders who were part of the community were inside the curtain. And anyone who was unknown to the community, because the, the government were putting spies into the churches to say, hey, this guy Paul, he's a preacher and he has no right. He's not ordained in the right kind of church. He's the guy you want to put in prison. Um, so the Baptists put up curtains. And if you were part of the community, you could come inside the curtain. If you weren't part of the community, you were behind the curtain and you stayed outside the curtain. So you could hear the sermon, but you could not tell it was Paul that was preaching. And so if the authorities were coming up the stairs, as they often did, and what the Baptists would do, they would put women on the stairs, um, some of the older men, who would deliberately be stopping the authorities to get up too quickly, they'd pull the, the preacher would sit down and they'd pull the curtain down and they wouldn't be able to tell who had been preaching. Yeah, so you got away. The other trick they had was beneath the floor was a trapdoor that the preacher could get down and take off. Uh, so, you know, when this, uh, yeah, yeah, when this um, next renovation project, um, keep that in heart. Um, so Baptist men and women were imprisoned. Baptist men and women were drowned. Um, they said, you want to be baptized? Um, be baptized. They bound them hand and foot and threw them in the river. A radical kind of faith. Um, and a deep commitment to walk together as a new community and watch over each other in love. This idea of covenanting that animated the earliest Baptists. To walk together in the ways of the Lord and to watch over one another in love. They joined themselves by a covenant into a church estate. This is written in the 1606. In the fellowship of the gospel, to walk in all his ways made known, and to be made known unto them according to their best endeavors, whatsoever it should cost them the Lord assisting. And one of the things I love about this phrase is that to walk in the ways of the Lord known, and as we walk together, the ways that become known by walking together. This emphasis on relationship, on covenant, so that in the Baptist life, Covenant with God, your faithfulness to God, goes hand in hand with your faithfulness to the people you're with in the community. Love for God and love for people in the community go hand in hand. You cannot love God and not love the people beside you. A radical love for God and a radical love for each other. This is Baptist covenanting, and all Baptist churches, and interestingly, when Baptist churches began in Aotearoa, the practice had fallen away in England. The first thing you notice in Baptist churches in New Zealand is they made covenants. So Cambridge Baptist has a covenant. The Baptist Tabernacle had a covenant. Nelson Baptist Church had a covenant. They restored this idea about covenant, which is really interesting. So Baptists covenant together, and then in Ephesians, the book I want to look at this morning, Paul gives us an account of what it looks like to live life in the new covenant. So if you have Bibles, we'll turn to Ephesians 2 and 3. Paul, in, in the letter to Ephesians, it's written in this kind of big picture that then slowly narrows its way down into every aspect of life. You know, marriage, uh, life together in the church, raising children, every aspect of life. From this big picture, he talks about this glorious mystery that's been revealed. And how is God's mystery revealed, says Paul, asks Paul. And the answer is it's revealed in the church, reconciled to God and one another. 
living life together in relationship. God's covenant with Israel has now been expanded and extended to include the Gentiles. The Gentiles are now included in this. And the images that Paul uses um, in, in chapter 2, verses, uh, in, in chapter 2, 11, and then on into 15 is where we'll look, he says, um, but now, so we'll begin at 11, so then remember that at one time you Gentiles, he's talking to the Gentiles, by birth called the uncircumcision, by those called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made by the f in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at one time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and he has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law and its commandments that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross. So the image, one of the images Paul is using here is an image that's drawn from the Jewish temple, the breaking down of the wall that divides. It's most likely that Paul is talking about the wall that divides the court of the Gentiles, where Gentiles who had joined the Jewish community were separated from the court of Israel. Yes, you can become part, you can be a proselyte Jew, but there is a boundary to where you're allowed to go. There's a court of Gentiles and a dividing wall, um, and then inside that is for the court of Israel only. Paul says Christ has come to break down that dividing wall, to, to abolish it, to smash it, to break it. Christ has broken down this dividing wall to create one new humanity. For Jews, there was a clear process for Gentiles to become part of the community. They were to be proselyte Jews, not Jewish, but actually proselyte Jews. Um, second, uh, they can be honorary Jews, but with that, there are boundaries to what they're allowed to do and where they're allowed to go and what, who they're allowed to be. Paul says, no, this is not the case in the gospel. Christ has broken down those walls that divide us. And he begins, it's interesting in this text, he begins scrambling for new words. Trying to find words to describe this new reality that's happened in Christ. And as he scrambles for these new words, he can't find them. And so what he does is to start to create new words. He makes up some words. Um, we don't notice it so much in our English Bibles. Um, but in the Greek, it's a lot clearer. Greek takes, uh, Paul takes the Greek prefix called sun, and you can see it on the left-hand side. The S is like a, that's the first one, that's an S in Greek, and then a U, and then the V is actually an N. So that's sun. It's a prefix that means together, or co, or... So, um, Chris and I, well, um, after the power went out, had to work together to get the garage door to go again. Um, and Alison was part of that too. Um, we work together. So in Greek, ergos, work. Sun, together. In English, we get synergy, working together. Or synthesis. Or syndicate. These words come from this prefix sun. Paul takes this prefix and starts just kind of throwing it everywhere in this text. So we say, in the, in literally in the Greek, and when, we were dead, and when we were dead through our trespasses, he made us co-alive together with Christ, is a better way of translating it. Or um, he co-raised us up with him and co-seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See how Paul is throwing this word co together everywhere in the text. In him the whole structure is co-joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are also co-built together into a dwelling place for God. This emphasis on co, not only has Christ abolished the dividing wall, he has knitted us together as colleagues, co-workers. Paul loves this word. And in chapter 3, he picks up this magnificent vision that God's plan for the ages has now been revealed. 
He says in chapter 3, For this is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. So God's mystery that Paul starts talking about, God's great plan for the world, um, that hasn't been known through the ages, he's now going to say is being revealed. He said it's been revealed to me by revelation as I wrote above. Uh, in former generations, this mystery was mo- not made known to humankind. It is as it has now been revealed to his holy, prophets, uh, holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This is the mystery revealed. That the Gentiles have become fellow, mem- uh, fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promised in Christ Jesus. It is not that the Gentiles are welcome as honorary Jews. It's that they're welcome as they are. And it's here that Paul goes a little crazy. Back to back. The Gentiles have become co-heirs, co-members of the same body, and co-sharers, in case you didn't hear it clearly enough. The Gentiles are welcome as they are. For many Māori in Aotearoa, there's a sense that the, ch- that, that the migrants, particularly from Britain and the church, arrived thinking they were Israel, and that Māori were the Gentiles. Flipping around the role of mana whenua and manuhiri and taking that to themselves. And the message too often has been, you need to change to become like me, and then we'll have unity. That is not Paul's message here. Not only is that a fundamental misunderstanding, we come as Gentiles, not as Israel, as manuhiri, not mana whenua. And the goal is not that you change to become like me, but that we all change together to become more like Christ. And so, as I've heard Ray say say many times, to be born again Christian and be born again Māori. That's the good news. All people are welcome as they are. That's the heart of the gospel. And Paul goes on to say that the role of the church is to display this radical unity in all its diversity. And by doing so, that's how the manifold wisdom of God is displayed to the world. So he says, of this gospel I've become, um, he goes on, and, uh, um, although the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church, the wisdom of God and its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. The church's common life of love together in its rich variety is what shows to the world that Jesus really does reconcile. So that if our churches are some of the most segregated places to be at 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning, then the rulers and the authorities can fold their arms and say, there's nothing to take notice of here. There's nothing that matters in that place. And we have to think that through for those who are here on Friday and on Saturday, hearing from Rupata uh, and Mana Whenua, the legacy that needs to be addressed in that space. And I know Paul and Sean are working at that. If the rugby club is more diverse than the church, then the world can think there's nothing very interesting going on here. But we are called to be co-heirs, co-members of the same body, and co-sharers in the promises of Christ through the gospel. So radical covenanting is central to being Baptist. Covenanting is central to the gospel and the church. And covenanting is central to our life in Aotearoa. In 2014, um, some of us in this room um, were up at Waitangi um, 10 years ago um, for the Baptist National Gathering, and it was a gathering there. It's the kind of annual jamboree of Baptists. If you want a party, that's the place to go. Um, Baptist jamboree. Um, But at the same time in 2014 as the Baptists were meeting, 
there was something more significant going on down the road at Titi Marae. At Titi Marae, after uh, the Baptists had a porphyry there um, and left, the Marae was set up for the very historic event of Ngapuhi presenting their evidence to the Crown about the meaning and effect of Titiriti or Waitangi. And some of you may know that it was at the conclusion of this that the government, the Crown, acknowledged that Māori did not cede their sovereignty in signing Titiriti or Waitangi. Ngāpuhi had been waiting for generations to give their evidence and their chance to explain the meaning and the effect of Titiriti or Waitangi. Um, I, um, I need to say that uh, for, there are Ngāpuhi in the room. I can see two over here. Uh, are there other Ngāpuhi in the room? Um, tēnā koe. Um, I need to say very clearly this evidence is not mine. This is what I've read and learnt from some others. If you have questions about Ngāpuhi evidence, these are the people to talk to, not me. Um, but their evidence is really significant as the, for the country and their evidence is really significant uh, for, for the church. Their understanding of Titiriti was preserved in their karakia and their waiata that Ngāpui Rangatira had prayed and sung at the signing of Titiriti or Waitangi. They'd learnt this evidence from tribal schools of learning and they had kept it within their iwi and not shared it with anyone else waiting for this day that they could share it with the crown. Ngāpui elders cited waiata and karakia that were constructed at the time of the signing of Te Tiriti and it upheld the sacredness of Te Tiriti. Uh, um, they brandished um, portraits of those of their, their ancestors who were present at the signing of Te Tiriti, um, weapons that were present at the signing of Te Tiriti, and they asked the Crown to come and enter the world of Ngāpui. Uh, Rima Edwards, in his... Um, and his evidence said this, He whakaputanga, or he wakaputanga, uh, te, o te rangatiratanga, uh, o nui tirini, te tiriti o waitangi, he kawanata tapu inei pukapuka, or the Declaration of Independence and te tiriti, these documents are sacred covenants for Ngapuhi. So Ngapuhi would speak about he kawanata tuatahi, the first covenant, the Declaration of Independence, he wakaputanga in 1835, and he kawanata tuarua, te tiriti o waitangi. Two covenants. Two covenants. One famous Ngāpui leader um, is Honiheke. Um, what's Honiheke famous for? What is it? Yeah, the flagpole. Cutting down the flagpole, right? Multiple times. Less famous, though, is that Honeheke said this. As Christ fulfilled and surpassed the old Mosaic law, so Te Tiriti could be likened to a new covenant through its promise of a new relationship between the crown and Māori. Said Honeheke, who had been schooled with the missionaries in Christian faith. And by this stage, you have Māori who have been in mission schools for 25 years learning about Christianity and expressing it in their own ways. And so there's the question always of, as for anyone, um, was it about converting to Christianity or converting Christianity? Well, that's always the case for all of us, right? It was the missionaries who took Te Tiriti around the country to work among the people that they'd been living with who had hosted them, mana whenua who had hosted them for decades. It was missionaries who used those relationships to explain te tiriti o waitangi on behalf of the crown and they explained it as a kawanata, as a covenant, a sacred covenant. At the 2014 hearing, the kaumata of Ngāpui explained the meaning of te tiriti to the crown from their matauranga, their sacred knowledges. Um, and if you haven't heard of here Wakaputanga, um, I suggest you talk to someone from Ngapui um, or do some work on it yourself. 
They said this in their evidence, um, it's hard to imagine that such agreements here, Wakaputanga and Te Tiriti o Waitangi, would have been reached without such discussions happening or without the rangatira being at the heart of them. The British records tend to focus on the actions and words of people like Busby and the missionaries. You know, they wrote journals and diaries. That was the really good stuff. But part of what Ngapui presented was to say this gives the British records and the writing on paper precedent. It elevates it as more significant than waiata and karakia and haka. The British records actually only give a narrow window of insight into what happened. And if anyone reads Kalenzo's story on the true history of Tetariti, you can see a lot of embellishment within what Kalenzo wrote. They went on to say, the tribunal looks at both treaties, Kingi Taurua, um, the Pākehā and the Māori, which is totally wrong. We did not sign the Pākehā Treaty of Waitangi. We signed the Māori version, Te Tiriti o Waitangi. We are here as Ngāpui to talk about the treaty that we in, uh, we're here to talk about the treaty that we in Ngāpui did not sign, the English version, and they are here to judge in English what our tūpuna signed in Māori. At the signing of Te Tiriti, many of Ngāpui rangatira signed Te Tiriti using their nose moko their muku from their nose to identify themselves. And part of what they presented as evidence is to say, yes, you're looking at Tetariti on Waitangi, but you're looking at in a vacuum. The reason our tupuna signed Tetariti with their nose moko is because Hongihika, the rangatira of Ngapuhi, went to England and met King George face to face. They shared breath. There is a primary and fundamental relationship that precedes anything on documents. It's a relational document. And they argued that what happens is that essentially these questions get separated out. Certain strands of the covenant, in effect, are an, are an effort to place them in conflict with one another. Oh, the English version says this, Te Reo Māori's version says that. The Crown's search for conflict within the document negates its overall context, which was the desire to create a relationship. That it is a relational document. It was a kawanata, a covenant for a relationship. And if, for Baptists, faithfulness to God is expressed in faithfulness and love to others of God's people, not just in the church, but all of God's people, we need to think about how loving our relationships have been. The evidence that Ngapui gave in 2014 was historic. It led the Crown to acknowledge that Māori did not cede their sovereignty at the signing of Te Tiriti o Waitangi. And I think 10 years later, with what some of the shenanigans that we're starting to see in politics here, it's important to remember this, to know it, and if we don't know it, to learn it. So Baptists are covenanting people. Faithfulness to God is expressed in faithfulness to God's people. And I want to say all of God's people. The gospel is a new covenant and the church is meant to be the community that bodies forth God's purposes for the world. You know, the church is kind of like the trailer to God's movie. The first fruits. If you want to know what the movie's like... If you want to get a sense of the movie, you watch the trailer. Um, so, Baptists are people of the covenant. The church are a community of the new covenant. And to use Ropata's phrase that I'm going to borrow, um, Aotearoans are people of a covenant. Covenant. Covenants about relationships. Deep and abiding relationships. You cannot love God in the abstract. It's about relationship. You cannot love the people beside you in abstract. It's about relationship. And you cannot love treaty partners in abstract. It's about relationship. 
It's about being co-raised, co-seated, co-citizens, co-joined, co-built, co-members, co-sharers, co-heirs. And maybe it asks questions even about co-governance. On behalf of my whanau, I want to thank Ngāti Rārua Te Atiawa, uh, Ropata, um, Kevin, um, Gladys, and Sean. I want to thank you for your manakitanga this weekend. Ngā mahi, ngā, ngā mahi, uh, ngā mahi nunui. It's been really special for me to meet you, uh, to share breath, and, and to share kai. Um, I am connected, connected to this land through whakapapa, um, manuhiri whakapapa, but whakapapa. Thank you for hosting us. Thank you for sharing your mana with us. I want to thank Paul and Angela and Hannah and the, the, the Kossi family. Thank you for organising this weekend. Um, certainly for myself and Olivia, and I want to speak with Margaret and Amy as well. Thank you. It's really, really special to us. We're very, very grateful. Uh, it's open windows and connections that we need, I need, to become Pākehā, which I talked about. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious too that you know, this is a big work that you've been doing going through deep waters. So I want to acknowledge you and thank you for that. I want to thank you, Sean. Um, your friendship is really important to me. Uh, you've taught me a lot. I've grown so much through your friendship. Thank you for all the work you've put in, the mahi this weekend, the hangi, the, you name it, there's so much beautiful to go to the urupa. Thank you, Ropata, and see the work going in in that space, the work you've been doing, I know, um, on behalf of, with the iwi. Um, thank you for your friendship. Ngā mahi, ngā mahi, ngā mahi nunui. Um, I also want to thank uh, Ray Totarewa, uh, Ngāti Pukenga, uh, and Tainui, Waka, uh, Ray, thank you for coming to Tautoko this hiding and to Afi me. Um, you're a very special person, period, but you're a very special person to me. So, mm. uh, tēnā koi. Um, to AJ and the Aorotahi team, I want to thank you. Thank you for coming and being part of this hiding to, to giving it importance and significance that it requires. I think it's a, um, a seed for Baptists. I really do. I think the relationship you've forged with Sean and are forming and developing is a genuine seed on behalf of Baptists. That's much, much needed. So thank you. Uh, ngā mahi, ngā mahi, ngā mahi, ngā mahi nunui. Um, finally, I want to thank the whānau at Motueka Baptist um, for putting up with us for the weekend. Um, I hope it's been a significant weekend for you. It may be very new, or it may be th I'm conscious there's others who have deep relationships. Uh, with hapu here. Um, wherever you are on that spectrum, I hope it's opened up connections for you. Um, connections that are not just to be understood as only relationships, but covenant relationships. Um, we've loved our time here. Um, I want to um, thank you on behalf of Olivia and I, and as I say, Margaret and Amy who are at home. Um, not every Baptist church is doing this work. They're not. But I hope you can get a feeling over this weekend that what is good for Māori is good for all. What enables Māori to flourish enables all to flourish. Our covenants aren't for a weekend. Weekends are fun, they're awesome. Covenants are a relational commitment to walk together, no matter what, and watch over one another in love. That's what they do. My hope for you is that you commit to keep walking together, particularly with Ngāti Rārua Te Ateawa, and to watch over one another in love. So for me, cut a fewer. Go for it. Go hard. Tuturu whakamaua ki a tīna. Tīna. Home year, who year? Taiki. Reda tena koto, tena koto. Kia ora koutou, Lives, this is your time to shine. Waiata <laughs> tōtoko. 
Um, hopefully some of you here, we learned this last night with sign language. I have to, aroha mai, whanau. Um, I got a sign wrong. Uh, that's aroha. I went and checked with, uh, with Richard. That's aroha. Whakapono. Okay. Bring him out here. And then Tato, get the witty going. Like Sean here. Okay, so Tato, Tato. Thanks, Andrew. And um, we're going to sing uh, to here. And um, as we sing this, you know, it's uh, our prayer that that we, my prayer, that this is our prayer. That um, that there would be something uh, among us, and by God's Spirit through us. Um, that will bless this land and bless the people of this land and that as a community we become so much stronger. It is about relationship. It is about covenant. It's about enabling ourselves to, to look at one another in the way that Jesus looks at each one of us and to, to look for the best in one another and to draw out the best in one another. And uh, I just was saying last night, wasn't I, that it's about relationship. It's about like a, a marriage where, you know, Andrew and I got married after knowing each other for about a year. I mean, we hardly knew each other. And certainly the person that I am now is different to the person I was then. And the same for Angela. And I've become a little bit more organized than I ever was. <laughs> and she's become a little bit more relaxed and laid back than she ever was. There's something that's rubbed off, but Angela is still Angela. And I'm still Paul. And that's the journey that we're on in this nation, I believe. And we're better, as Andrew said, the most important place for that to be expressed is in God's church. So let us sing this as a, as a, as a prayer and uh, let it live on in us as uh, we continue in this journey and uh, in this life together. Mm.
It's you, Jesus, you who have broken down the wall that divides. It's your love that's freed us. And so we come under your headship, your lordship afresh today as individuals, as a church, Fano, and we would pray for this community in Aotearoa. Lord, may we come under your lordship, your kingship afresh and demonstrate this amazing work that you've done to unite people into your big family. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to uh, close with a blessing and uh, then have some um, kai. But I uh, invite you to stay because um, we'll then have poruaki as well. So uh, looking forward to hearing and uh, sharing together through that time. <laughs>